Welcome to Ekan Ballistics 101, the series that we only get to do about once a year because I'm just too darn lazy to, to film it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, welcome to Ekan Ballistics 101. We're on part 10 today and this is actually an episode that's very, very relevant to the kind of phase of uh, air gun uh, innovation and advancement that we're going through over the past couple of years. It's something that you probably won't see or something that's probably not relevant to most firearm ballistic tutorials so it'll be something new for us and uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. The topic is subsonic, transonic and supersonic flight. Let's get into it. Where should we start? Well, if you watch a video on ballistics in long range center fire rifle shooting and you look at the maximum effective range of a bullet, you'll notice that the maximum effective range of a bullet pretty much coincides with the maximum supersonic range of that bullet. In other words, people have figured out that a precision rifle becomes pretty much useless as soon as the bullet drops out of the supersonic range and into what we call the transonic range. Some funny things start to happen to the bullet and from a physics point of view, it's very, very difficult to uh, determine how that bullet's gonna behave. So airflow velocity is obviously something that's very important and we can divide airflow velocity up into three sections. Subsonic, which is where all airflow around a projectile is slower than the speed of sound. Supersonic, where all airflow is faster than the speed of sound. And transonic, which is where airflow around a projectile is part subsonic and part supersonic. If Mach 1 is the speed of sound, then the transonic region is roughly defined as between Mach 0.8 to Mach 1.2. Mach 0.8 being round about 900 feet per second and Mach 1.2 being round about 1,350 feet per second. The lower end of the transonic region is sometimes called the critical Mach number or M crit because it's that point at which some of the airflow around the projectile starts to go supersonic and that's when funny things start to happen. So how can there be supersonic and subsonic airflow at the same time? You know, most people think there's a clear divide between the two and the, the change happens in an instant. Well, that's not the case. The reason the transonic zone exists is because airflow over a projectile or a, an aircraft or whatever can speed up or slow down as it passes over that shape. Basically, there are areas of high pressure zones and low pressure zones which cause the speeding up and slowing down. In other words, a projectile traveling much slower than the speed of sound can actually experience supersonic shock waves forming on its surface. And supersonic airflow in itself is really not a bad thing. And that's why center fire rifles can shoot bullets at blitzing speeds and still have extreme precision. It's only when you drop down back into the transonic region from supersonic flow that things start to go pear-shaped. In other words, a projectile traveling slower than the speed of sound can experience supersonic shock waves being formed around it at those low velocities. And supersonic shock waves in themselves are not a problem. Supersonic airflow is not a problem. A precision rifle, center fire rifle shooting at blitzing speeds um, can still maintain perfect precision and have very predictable airflow over it. But when you have supersonic shock waves forming over a portion of a projectile, especially a projectile that's designed specifically for stability at subsonic speeds you have some extremely unpredictable forces moving around the center of pressure shifts and that's where things start to go pear-shaped you may have spoken to somebody who's flown in a concord you may have flown in a concord yourself or you may know somebody who has served as a fighter pilot they will tell you that the transition from subsonic into transonic can be very very unpleasant at transonic speeds, the aircraft can vibrate. It can feel like it's difficult to control. It can experience funny uh, movements as the, the shock waves oscillate over its surface. Just really unpleasant. That's one of the big reasons why commercial airline pilots don't fly faster than the critical Mach number. And talking about the critical Mach number, let's actually hear from a pilot who has experience with this himself. Hey guys, my name is Cameron. I am a friend of Matt's and I fly these things. Um, not these particular ones, they're a little bit bigger than this. Uh, this is Boeing 737-800 and um, the relationship between how an aircraft reacts and how an aircraft moves through the air is very, very similar to 
how a projectile moves through the air. So a couple of things to note. Around the world at the moment, we don't really have many airliners that are operating in the transonic range and even in the supersonic range. And there are very uh, important reasons for that. This aircraft specifically has a maximum Mach number of 0 0.82, um, which is its certified maximum. Uh, the reason being is that as we start to accelerate through that transonic range above 0 0.8, 0 0.9, drag increases very significantly which in turn causes the amount of fuel required to increase very significantly. Aerodynamically we get weird uh, effects and weird uh, results on the airframe. For example on the ailerons the elevator at the back as well as the rudder uh, control surfaces there are adverse effects which happen. For example the fluttering of that control surface it starts to move and shake in the turbulent airflow, there's a high increase in, in pressure and um, temperature as we move through the speed of sound, which is not good for efficiency and airline operation. So for us, we, we generally cruise at about 0 0.78, 0 0.79 as, a, as an eco economic uh, Mach number, and that's what we use in these aircraft. Transonic uh, flight is not really sustainable and um, that's why if you look at a military application for example a military jet um, that aircraft accelerates quickly through the speed of sound and it then sustains a speed greater than um, Mach 1.5 generally Mach 2 is, is um, way more uh, applicable in, in case of the military however that is a special case and it's not very fuel efficient um, and it's not sustainable for commercial aviation as in this uh, 737 for example and that's why Airbus, Boeing, Embraer, all these aircraft manufacturers do not produce aircraft that fly in the transonic range. It just doesn't work, it's not, it, it, you know, it's, it's not sustainable at all. So that's a little bit from my side. Cheers. So hopefully you get the point. Subsonic is good, Supersonic is good and Transonic is really bad. <laughs> so let's look specifically at air gun projectiles and see how they respond to different speeds. You'll notice there are zones of high pressure and low pressure over these slugs and pellets. What this means is that the projectile will inevitably experience partial supersonic flow as the air speeds up over certain parts. Thus, there is a limit to how fast we can shoot them before they start to lose accuracy. You may notice an interesting contrast between the way that uh, a cheap Springer, for example, is marketed towards an inexperienced Plinker and a precision PCP might be marketed towards a very experienced competition shooter. A cheap Gamma Springer, for example, might proudly advertise that it's capable of shooting at 1,200 feet per second, but you won't see a precision rifle manufacturer like Steyr, uh, Thomas, FX or Daystate advertising that, and that's because those companies know that 1,200 feet per second is right in the middle of transonic zone and they are not going to get good accuracy at those speeds. Interestingly enough though, the air gun world seemed to figure out by itself that around about 900 feet per second seemed to be the maximum for stable flight with most pellets without even realizing that this just happened to be exactly where the transonic zone starts. It's funny how we sometimes climb the mountain of trial and error you know, expecting to be first to the top and we get to the summit only to realize that science has been waiting there for us the whole time, right? <laughs> but in defense of trial and error, I always used to believe that 930 feet per second and up was too fast for an air gun. But then the JSB Monster redesigns came out a few years ago. Everyone started shooting them at 980 to 1000 feet per second with excellent results. And this really surprised me until I looked at airflow simulations. It turns out that there are ways to manipulate the airflow. Certain design aspects can raise the critical Mach number and allow you to shoot faster with less side effects. A JSB Monster's longer shape makes it more stable at higher speeds than its shorter brothers and the same thing is seen with slugs. A slug's uh, longer ogive and smoother surface allow the airflow to kind of accelerate a little bit slower over its surface and that allows us to raise the critical Mach number and actually shoot them with stability at higher speeds. The firearms industry has been trying to do this for a long time. Um, if you look up a caliber like the 4.8 Shytac, 
basically Shytac built a rifle and bullet system that worked together with a perfect twist rate and a really good bullet design to allow the bullet to remain stable through the transonic zone and into subsonic speeds for extreme long range shooting, um, even if that center of pressure was shifting. Just a really stable bullet design for that sole purpose. You can learn a lot from analyzing velocity changes over distance. The ballistic coefficient of most pellets fired at 1,000 feet per second will be worse than at 900 feet per second, which kind of indicates that they're not entirely stable at these high speeds. Some slugs and pellets, on the other hand, have better BCs at high speeds, indicating that the airflow is actually a little bit smoother at these high speeds. The FX hybrid slugs, for example, have an incredibly high BC when fired at 1,000 feet per second and remain completely stable. Some other slugs prefer to be shot slower. If you look at the drag curve of GA projectiles, which is the drag function that pellets fall under, and G1 and RA4 drag functions, which is what most air gun slugs fall under, you'll see a spark at transonic speeds. You want to stay away from that spark if possible, that's increased drag. At subsonic speeds, the, 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 the increase in drag is roughly proportional to the increase in velocity, but the moment you hit M crit, you'll see there's a, a disproportionate climb in the drag, and that's because of those supersonic shock waves forming on the surface. In other words, you're just gonna use a lot of air and lose a lot of speed. It's not good. But look at the supersonic section of that drag curve. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? So here's the big question. If supersonic flight is as stable as subsonic flight, why are we not trying to shoot air gun projectiles at supersonic speeds? Well, for one, it's noisy, but aside from that, there are some very big limitations with air guns. Centrefire rifles operate at around 60,000 PSI. That's 20 times more than the 3,000 PSI that your PCP might operate on. Scuba tanks are never going to be filled to 60,000 PSI, let's be honest. You're always going to have that limitation. And as a result, you're going to be shooting light, low BC projectiles at slower speeds for the foreseeable future. Even if you were able to shoot like an 18 grain JSB at 1,500 feet per second, the BC is so bad that it would so quickly drop in, back into the transonic zone that you just wouldn't get any accuracy out of it anyway. Obviously, the recipe for good long-range performance is a heavy, high BC projectile at very high speeds, but it might be worth it sacrificing some of that speed and instead adding more weight, which improves the uh, sectional density, which in turn improves the ballistic coefficient. And the same can apply actually to, to close range shooting. I mean, look at 25 meter bench rest shooters. For heavy varmint class, which is limited to 20 foot pounds, you just won't find anyone shooting 8.4 grain JSBs at blitzing speeds. You'll find that almost everyone wants to use heavier pellets at slower speeds. The point of this video is to give a little bit of context to people who wonder why precision shooters like myself willingly bring down the velocity of our rifles. You know, we could be shooting much faster, but we choose not to. And also to maybe help out some guys who have been shooting as fast as they can and wondering why they can't get good accuracy out of their guns. If you're seeing a wobble of your pellet or you're seeing a bit of a spiral and you're trying to shoot fast, bring down the velocity a bit, it may work wonders. But also keep in mind that the ability to shoot a projectile at very fast speeds while maintaining stability is something that we should be aiming for and something that can really give us the competitive edge. I'm hoping to rent a high-speed camera sometime next year and do some tests with Schlieren imaging to document how different shaped projectiles behave at different speeds. Schlieren imaging allows you to see shock waves and shock waves tell you a lot. Maybe we'll see some major breakthroughs in airgun projectile technology. I feel that we already have made some big breakthroughs over the past few years. Who knows what could happen? If you want to learn more about this topic, I'm going to put two links in the video description. One that's kind of a video aimed towards firearm shooters who want to learn about transonic airflow and one that's aimed towards uh, aviators who want to learn about transonic airflow. But even though I'm not an aviator, I find that video super interesting. I learned a lot from it, so check it out. And with that said, thank you so much for watching. Merry Quis Christmas, Christmas, <laughs> and I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> Christmas, what the heck is Christmas?